Hi everyone, this is Gary Bowers with the Williamson County chapter of the Native Plant Society of Texas. Uh, we'll give everyone just a few minutes to, to join and then we'll get started. Uh, we've got a really large meeting tonight uh, based on the number of registrants. Um, so that'll take just a second to, to let everybody get in. All right, looks like it's starting to stabilize now. So everybody that was in queue should have joined us. We've got about 92 attendees. And then there's the three panelists, which would be myself, Randy Pensipine, and our speaker tonight, who's going to be Carol Clark. Uh, again, my name is Gary Bowers, and I'm a member of the Williamson County Chapter of the Native Plant Society of Texas. I'll be acting as your facilitator tonight. Uh, just a quick note that this meeting will be recorded, and we'll post it to YouTube once it's complete, um, probably next week sometime. So if you're not able to attend the whole evening, uh, you can certainly catch up there and then share it with your friends. We will have Q&A. Uh, so at the end of Carol's presentation, we'll do Q&A. And then at the end of Randy's business meeting, we'll do Q&A. At any time during the meeting, you can click the Q&A button, which you should be able to find in the Zoom interface. And you can send questions there. I'll be watching that. And with that, I will hand it over to Randy to do the business portion. And then after the business portion of the meeting, uh, Randy will hand that over to our speaker, Carol. All right. Okay, I guess it's me now. Um, I am Randy Pensabine, the current president for Native Plant Society, Williamson County. Welcome everyone. We're uh, real excited to have Carol today. Uh, business meeting, really short, as all business meetings should be. Uh, today's plant of the month is the golden crown beard. And this is uh, not only a patch, border patch host, but it's also a great nectar source for many butterflies and other pollinators. At your garden, host plants are wonderful, but don't forget about the nectar as well to feed the adults. So that is one you will find. Uh, it is an annual and it, it likes, <coughs> excuse me, likes full sun. But uh, it does bloom a long, long time. It's a prolific bloomer. Blooms all summer long into the uh, early fall there. So get your golden crown beard and it can get quite large as well. Uh, activities completed since our last meeting. The Front Yard Native Prairie presentation by Andrew Brazell. We, we, uh, we had him speak in August of 2019, but we've neglected to get his slides and we recently had a web question and uh, his presentation had covered a lot of the information the individual was looking for. So Pat Donica uh, mentioned it to me and we reached out and he sent us his slides. Those are now posted. So, but they're only posted, uh, if you go to our meetings, you'll be able to find the August 8th, 2019 meeting and Front Yard Native Prairie and take a look at his slides if you're interested in doing uh, more than just a little patch of wildflowers. Also this month, uh, the invasives removal continues with Charles Newsom and his hardy volunteers. This is out of Berry Springs Park and Preserve and he's gotten a really good handle on the invasives out there. And he's starting to look forward to new projects. And one of his new projects will be uh, look at, at Gary Park and he's worked on a location map and he said he has the trees pretty well completed, the invasive trees and it's very nice because it doesn't have as much water out at Gary Park so he has fewer invasive plants. They really like the uh, wet spots of uh, Berry Springs along the creek and the pond and all. So as far as pollinator gardens, there's one at uh, the Berry Springs Park is actually a habitat and uh, habitat restoration. That one's going well, everything's being watered. Uh, we're keeping an eye on the uh, just cages and everything else going on up there. Nest also is, is in good shape, uh, spirit reigns. Looking really good, customers really happy, and we are looking at going out there and doing some weeding. If you wanna come help us weed out there, give a shout out to Randy or to Beth. Uh, Georgetown Public Library, that's uh, pretty well just 
sitting there doing its thing. And that looks really nice. Agnes and Marilyn go over there and take care of that. And so that's also looking really good. So we thank everyone for all the hard work they're doing. Uh, one of our questions we got when we did our election, we had a, uh, a survey about the same time. And one of the questions we got was, I, I'm really not familiar with who the board is and you know names and faces. So rather than just give you a list of names, which we did last time, now I'm going to put a face to that name. And I don't know if y'all can see my cursor, but over here is myself, Randy Pensabine. Denny Shea is my vice president, and, and these positions start September 1. The majority of them are carryovers from last year, uh, continuing on for their second year. Nancy Pumphrey, secretary. Aaron Buell, I'm sorry, I always do that. Aaron Buell, our treasurer. Jane Catalano, director. Charles Newsom is also a director. He is uh, the invasive guy. And Gary Bowers, your host tonight, and also past president, as well as our technical guru. And uh, Kathy Galloway does our field trips, uh, her and a team of people. They work together and she coordinates it. Nancy Copperman is new to the board. She's doing membership. And so she's the one that sends you a nice letter when you renew or join up. So we appreciate that. We appreciate the support very much. Gary Bowers also involved in NLCP with Sue Weissman. And they are looking forward to this fall and doing a, a virtual class. So they're working on that right now. Susie Hickman, wonderful job of getting us programs. That's, that's one of those jobs that is behind the scenes, but it takes quite a bit of effort. Beth Irwin works on uh, projects as well as plant sales. So that's, that's her purview. Diana Wilson, uh, new to the team as well. We're pleased to have her join us. She's gonna work with community engagement, take, uh, take over Facebook and Instagram and try and get the word out and do a better job of keeping everyone informed as to our activities and our meetings. So we look forward to that as well. And Pat Donica also working behind the scenes there to keep everything running smooth. Keeps me on my toes, catches my mistakes, and does all the postings to the website. So we appreciate all the work she does on that. And we appreciate everyone on the board. Okay, plant sales. This uh, just talked with Beth the other day. And we're talking about a plant sale to do the farmer's markets again, like we did in the spring. We're gonna advertise a little more. Again, because it's a farmer's market, it won't be a huge, huge sale like we do down at the Wildflower Center, but the Wildflower Center has uh, canceled their plant sale for the fall. Uh, we hope they'll be able to open up in the spring. But uh, we're gonna do a couple of markets. We will be announcing the times, dates, locations, et cetera, and asking for volunteers through our, our emails. So watch for your email on plant sales. And if you have special requests, you know how to send them over to us. And we do, uh, last time we had good success with people sending us emails for special plants and we pick those up because it's hard to bring everything to the market. But if we know you want something special and we see it at our vendor, we will pick that up and bring it to the plant cell for you. Uh, field trips. We have no field trips planned except for what they are doing a virtual field trip at the River Ranch County Park. This is a new county park. It is currently closed to the public. Uh, they are constructing a almost 5,000 square foot interpretive center, which is just gorgeous. Uh, it is funded by bonds in the Texas Parks and Wildlife because this is such a, a wonderful addition to the county parks here. Uh, and also in this area, we don't have any state parks. So the, the goal is to have it uh, operate much like a state park. Sue Weissman and Gary Bowers are working on the, on the preview with the director of the park, and we 
really appreciate his cooperation in letting them come in and uh, also providing a tour guide to drive them around and, and help with that. So I look forward to that being done. And Gary, I'm not sure when that'll, that'll be done, but it shouldn't be too much longer, uh, a few weeks, probably two weeks or something. Yeah, we'll, we'll have two. Um, so there'll be a, a first one that's a preview because, I mean, it is 1,300 acres, so we don't want to okay. do it all in one, one go. Uh, so we'll do at least two of them. And uh, we did collect the video uh, this past Tuesday, and I'll work with Sue and Allie, who's the, the parks okay. uh, employee who's going to help us over the weekend and hopefully in the next week or so. Excellent. I'm looking forward to that. Okay, our upcoming programs. Next month, we have Mushrooms of Texas. Again, that will be virtual. After that, we're going to have Jane Tillman. A lot of us know her. She's a birder extraordinaire. And then uh, UT and Dell Medical Center Native Landscaping, Justin Hayes on that. So if you have any speaker ideas, please contact Susie Hickman or myself or just send an email through our blog and it'll get to her. We appreciate the, the help and the suggestions. So now we're happy to welcome Carol Clark. She's a longtime NIPSOP member, just a wonderful chair of the Bring Back the Monarchs to Texas Committee and involved with conservation specialists with the Monarch Watch statewide, master naturalist and amateur botanist. So welcome Carol, we're, uh, we're real, really, really pleased you agreed to do this. So it's a you. pleasure to be here and uh, thank you all for coming. I realize that everyone has options about what to do tonight and so thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to attempt to get my screen pulled up here and get this working and let's see. All right, hopefully everyone sees one big butterfly picture there as yep. the beginning of my slideshow yep, and let me here. make sure that we're we're going. Um, okay, so you may have tuned in tonight hoping to see a program about Monarch Butterfly Basics. And unfortunately, this is not quite that program. This program was designed to give to the Native Plant Society Symposium to chapter members all over the state to help them understand the role of the BBMT. What is that? That is the Bring Back the Monarchs to Texas Committee out of the Native Plant Society of Texas. Um, I was getting a lot of feedback indicating that people didn't really know what we did, why we were there, and why were we messing about with insects when we are part of the Native Plant Society. So I put together this program in part to help you understand that. If you um, did expect some butterfly biology today, we'll tuck that into the nooks and crannies of the program. Um, okay, so this is not advancing here. I need to decide why, and let's see if that works. Yes, so a while back, uh, there was a symposium at which there were members of the Native Plant Society of Texas and members of Monarch Watch, including Chip Taylor, their director, um, and they were sitting around after dinner one evening just chatting about mutual goals and decided to try to do something together. And that uh, sort of sparked the launch of the Bring Back the Monarchs to Texas Committee, where the Native Plant Society decided uh, it would be housed under the Native Plant Society and run by them. Uh, they would contribute some money each year. Monarch Watch would contribute some money each year. And both organizations would, you know, welcome contributions to this committee's doings. Um, and so it's sort of a joint venture between the two groups. The purpose of the committee is kind of twofold, to provide education about native plants and monarch butterflies, and to promote actual additional monarch habitat that uses native Texas plants throughout Texas. If you have not already heard, Texas is crucial to the monarch butterflies future survival. Almost all monarch butterflies east of the Rocky Mountains in, t in uh, the entire nation and up into Canada have to migrate through Texas uh, sort of twice a year. It's not the same butterflies both times. 
in the spring, they come north through Texas and those adult butterflies are looking for milkweeds to lay their eggs on. They need those milkweeds for their caterpillars. And they're also looking for nectar plants so the adults can drink. But in the fall, those, the generations further, uh, fourth generation away from those migratory butterflies are going to come back down through Texas and they will also need nectar plants then. And if Texas doesn't provide what the monarchs need on their way through, uh, this life cycle chain is broken, future generations can't be produced, and the monarch butterfly really suffers if Texas doesn't step up and do its part. So in support of these two goals, to provide education and additional monarch habitat, one of the things that was decided is that the committee would run an annual garden grant program. And that's sort of the meat of today's program, the garden grant program and how that works. Uh, garden requirements for this garden grant program are based on the monarch way station concept, which was conceived by Monarch Watch originally. So what is a monarch way station? Very simply, it is a place that provides all the things that monarchs need to flourish. It provides host plants, which would be milkweeds and they're very close allies. In Texas, we recommend uh, three milkweeds highly and then others depending on which region of Texas you're in. But the green milkweed, the antelope horns milkweed and zizodes milkweed uh, fill most of our Eco, uh, ecological niches and um, most of the monarchs needs in Texas. There are also plants like Texas milkweed, aquatic milkweed, uh, swamp milkweed, which are great monarch plants as well. And we can talk about that another time. Promise to come back if you want to program on uh, just plants for butterflies. Uh, but it will provide those host plants. It will provide nectar plants because adult butterflies, they do not chew plants. They have to drink nectar to gain energy to fly and to lay those eggs. And then it also needs to provide shelter for monarch butterflies. And this does not have to be a constructed house, like a birdhouse or anything like that. It can be as simple as a clump grass that provides a sort of a skirt for the monarchs to climb into or under. It can be a dense shrub or a dense tree where monarchs can simply get out of the wind, the rain, and in Texas, sometimes the hail. Once you have a garden that sort of meets these Monarch Way Station criteria, you can register that with monarchwatch.org and your way station will be assigned a number and put on the map with other way stations if you choose to register it. Um, and it, you don't have to register it for it to do good for the monarchs, but it sort of helps to encourage other people if everybody m registers their way stations and lets people know what they're doing with that piece of ground. Right now, there are over 25,000 way stations in the U.S., and Texas leads the way. We are ahead, but there's one of those M states up in the upper Midwest that is catching up quickly, and Texas just needs to do its part and have the most way stations because we're Texas and we're cool. Once you're registered, if you choose to, you could purchase one of the little signs that will help tell your neighbors what you're doing with your way station. And again, this way station concept is something that it was cooked up at Monarch Watch uh, to be a simple way to let your neighbors know what you're doing and to ensure that you had all the things that monarchs would need in your garden. Uh, but a garden under the garden grant program does not have to be a registered way station to apply and receive a grant. I just wanted to make that clear. So again, those three things, nectar plants for adults, milkweeds for the caterpillars to eat, shelter for adults, and everyone asks about water. Don't they need water? Well, the truth is adult butterflies pretty much get all the moisture they need from the nectar that they drink. And the larvae will get all the water that they need from the plants that they're chewing. So supplemental water is not necessary for a monarch garden, but if you do add water, other butterflies and birds and other insects will be grateful. And so that's fine. I've heard people say, I don't wanna apply for one of those 
designations because then I have to add a water feature and I don't really know how to do that. For this particular grant, you really don't. A Monarch Way Station could go pretty much anywhere. This man that put in this one applied to the county to use a little unused strip of county roadway. And it's a very linear Monarch Garden. He's left some room for grass by the street so that that could be mowed short for safety reasons and visibility reasons. But he's put in a lot of nectar and host plants for the Monarchs up and down that strip. This one I love. It's really kind of a win, win, win all over situation. These little modular gardens were put into a juvenile detention center. And I think those are master gardeners who um, spearheaded this project, but they actually take the juvenile detainees out. They teach them gardening skills. Um, and these little days in the garden where they get to practice these skills and tend these butterfly gardens are really good and calming for the detainees. It gives them some skills that they may be able to use to um, for employment once they get out of there and go on with their regularly scheduled lives. And it's just a great idea altogether. This way station is in someone's front yard, and it's actually in a front yard in Plano. Michael McDowell has a blog. His blog name is Plano Bluestem. You can look him up and go visit his blog. Um, but he has unlawned his front yard and put in a prairie themed garden instead. And you can see that even in a little suburban front yard, not very large, the monarchs have found that garden and they are using it. This one's from my own front yard. Uh, Michael McDowell really inspired me to unlawn my front yard and put in a prairie pollinator garden there as well. And one day I was out teaching at a school. I had had 250 kids go through by the end of the day and I was exhausted. At the end of that day, the biology teacher said, you know, some days I wonder, I talk and talk and I wonder if anything I say or do makes a difference. <laughs> and I thought, wow. Now I'm not just exhausted, I'm exhausted and depressed. So I went home in kind of a blue funk, pulling up to my curb, mulling those words and wondering, does anything I say or do make any difference in the world? And as I pulled up to my curb, there was sort of a flutter of activity in my garden. And when I checked, there were 13 monarchs bedding down for the night in my goldenrod, in my little tiny suburban lot. So even in a small suburban yard, yes, you can make a difference. Or some other urban landscape, a little plot at a library or a cemetery or an urban center. You can use other people's spaces and sometimes other people's money to put in your Monarch Way Station. Look at all the places here that I've listed where they've already gone in. Um, and you might think of some places that you're associated with. Maybe you're the landowner or maybe you're not, but you might be able to get permission from those landowners to put them into some of these types of places. And then maybe you'll find that they just wanted the people and the experience and the volunteers to put that in and they're willing to help you out with the financing of the plants for that space. And then there's always the garden grant program, which we're getting to. Milkweeds, some of them will grow fine in a pot. If all you have is an urban balcony, you can put in a teeny tiny monarch way station with a couple of nectar plants and a milkweed in a pot. Remember that for small creatures, small creatures, small spaces can make a big difference. So don't be intimidated by not having a lot of space. If you do have space like we do up on our wildlife refuge, uh, that's great. Go ahead and use that. This is shiny goldenrod blooming in Cook County, and it looks like that this week. This was taken a couple of years back, but that's exactly what it looks like at this point in August. And the early migration, uh, monarchs are starting to show up, sort of the late summer migration, and they are using these, these goldenrods right now. So we'd all like to see this in our spaces. We'd all like for our children and our grandchildren to still be able to see monarchs as they grow up. 
And uh, to do that, we need to make sure that Texas has what the monarchs need when they pass through our spaces, primarily in the spring and the fall. We have a few monarchs in the summer, but not so many. For the most part, they have moved north out of Texas by the first week of June, and we just have a few little renegade leftovers over the summer. So how about those garden grants? If you want to put in a garden and you think, gee, I might know a place where this should go, how do we go about applying for one of those grants? Well, there are some things to think about. The gardens that we fund must include Texas native milkweeds and Texas native nectar plants. We do not spend money, and especially not the Native Plant Society's money, on non-native plants. That simply isn't the way it works. Currently, grants are limited to a maximum of $400, but you may apply for less, and people do. The money must all be spent by October 31st in most years. This year, in this very strange year we're all experiencing, we've been a little lenient and told people that if they need to adjust their timelines to account for uh, COVID cancellations, that they can do that as long as they let us know what's going on and how their timeline is slipping and uh, keep us informed about what's going on. After the money is spent, they have a month to let us know um, that it has been spent, the plants have been installed, and uh, here's what it looks like. So we're hoping for a report that includes some photos and some words about what's been done with that grant money. In previous years, we asked people to put those gardens in by May 30th. And feedback was telling us that this wasn't so good for the schools, that it was very difficult for a school to keep a garden alive over the summer when it had just been planted in the spring. Some of those plants didn't have really great established root systems over the summer, and they needed too much care and too much water. So we thought it would be better if schools in particular could install plants in the fall under the uh, parameters of the grant. So now that's a possibility. Gardens can be installed in the spring after the grant money goes out, but they can also be installed in the fall. We don't really recommend that anybody be out there in the heat of July or August in Texas installing a garden. Again, it can only be used for native plants or native plant seeds, but it can also not be used for any of the hardscape elements of a design. Uh, it cannot be used for uh, paying professionals for designing. It cannot be used for signs, for mulch, for rocks, for benches, for soil amendments, none of those things. They all count as soil amendments and hardscaping. Um, it's only to be spent on physical plants or seeds. Gardens must have public access with good education potential. And that education potential could really vary from site to site. Some of it's very passive, some of it's extremely active. This is Clear Creek Nature Center um, or um, Natural Heritage Center in Denton. Um, and at the time this was taken, this young lady was sort of the urban gardening guru up there teaching people about how to garden and using the demonstration monarch garden um, uh, for some of those classes. It's an elementary school. I believe this one's in Dallas, and I love how engaged these kids are with the butterflies they're seeing in this sidewalk strip. Notice where that strip is. There's the sidewalk and there's a brick wall. That would seem like an in inhospitable site, like you couldn't really grow very much there, but it is in heavy active use by the butterflies who had no trouble finding it in that location. Here's one at a farmstead in Plano. And this was not actually a grant garden, but it's an example of a place where a monarch way station would be very welcome and have great educational potential. Gardens must showcase the native plants in a positive way. So there are lots of ways to go negative in a hurry. Um, some of those might include just a poor or unappealing design, um, uh, monotonous uh, plants and not a lot of variety. 
Um, or they might choose plants that are, you know, maybe great plants for monarchs, but known to be a bully in a garden situation. And in which case that may not show native plants in a great positive way when the public goes by to look at this garden two or three years later. Here are some examples of a garden that I do, I do think does showcase native plants in a positive way. Karen Albrecht sent me these pictures from the Tennyson Pollinator Parkway in Dallas. It is one of our grant gardens. Um, and they have carefully chosen their hardscape elements like pieces of wood uh, to combine with their plants to fill in the gardens while they were sparse and then um, carefully chosen their plants to service a lot of pollinators in addition to monarchs. I do think that overall effect is appealing and pleasant. Here's another way to showcase uh, native plants in a positive way. This was a seed mix and this was added after the Grant Garden actually went in on this site, but they had this piece of antique farm machinery at a heritage village in Allen and after they started with native plants in their Grant Garden, they kind of said, you know, we like the way these are performing. We like what we're seeing. We should put some wildflowers in there. So we kind of got uh, double benefits for our bucks on this one. First, they put in the garden that, that they had said they were going to put in, and then they decided to expand their use of native plants. And we'll see more from them later. Uh, here's one that at a junior college where it has great educational potential and a lot of different classes go out and use that. The art class, the language classes, the science classes all go out and have classes in this garden at some point. Uh, but it was put in, designed on the premise of a monarch way station and pollinator garden, and it's doing a great job where it is. I think this is Tennyson Pollinator Parkway again in, in one of its earlier years. This is from the Armstrong Elementary again. And this one is from a church in the Austin area, I believe. But again, appealing designs that we expect the public would walk by and say, wow, I like that. I think I'd like to replicate that in my own space. Now, what are we looking for on these applications? My rule of thumb is good intentions do not a garden make. And if you have worked with um, enthusiastic people before, you know that that's essential. You need the enthusiasm, but that's not enough. You also have to have some planning and some um, actual knowledge to really make a garden work. So while we look for enthusiasm on the applications, we're also looking for a skill set, some evidence that they've done their research and that they know how to make this garden work. Let's look at the sections of the application. It's actually a simple application and I have redesigned it over the last couple years. Uh, this, this committee has actually only had two chairmen. Kathy Downs headed it up very ably before I was chairman. Um, and she and I are the only remaining Monarch Watch Conservation Specialists in Texas. Kip Kippart was here, but he's recently moved. Uh, Monarch Watch Conservation Specialists are scattered all over the country, and there's even one in Canada now. Uh, but for Texas, Kathy Downs and I are really it. So uh, we were the only two heads of this committee. I took it over when Kathy was ready to step down. Uh, but I've redesigned the committee or the application a little bit for a particular reason. I wanted it to force people to think through all the aspects of designing a garden that's going to be there and be successful into the future and do the job that we're hoping it will do. So first we just need your contact information and you'd be surprised people fill these out and refuse to put down their phone number. Well, I'm not going to sell your phone number, but I really might want to call you to clarify some aspects of your application that don't look quite right. So please include your phone number and an email address where I can locate you. The project location is just what it sounds like. Where is the project physically going to be located? And number three, I actually had to add a permission section. The most important uh, aspect of this application is probably the garden design section. And I've intentionally asked a kind of fuzzy question. 
How will your project use Texas native plants to benefit monarchs and promote native plants for landscaping? The next part says list native milkweeds and native nectar plants to be used in your project. Now, sometimes we actually get somebody saying, we're going to use Texas native milkweeds and nectar plants, and we will choose from the ones that are available on such and such a date when we go plant shopping a week before our planting date. That actually reflects a dose of reality. They understand that although you may make a list, when you actually go plant shopping, those plants may or may not be on the shelf for you to buy. And so I realize those people might be a bit more experienced than it sounds like they are. Um, but they still have not provided me a list of native plants. What I'd prefer to see for those people is to list a lot of potential plants you're going to buy if you can, and then say you were going to choose from that list, if at all possible. Or choose your favorites and then supply a list of substitutes that you might substitute if you have to. Any of that works best for us. It lets us know you know what you're talking about when you choose plants. The next portion, draw out your garden design plan on a separate sheet of paper and attach to completed form. Do not omit this portion. It's right there in writing. It gives us a valuable information um, source on your overall preparedness and ability to complete the project. We'd love to be able to judge what's in your head, but in truth, all that's in front of the committee is just what you submitted. Here's one that was actually pretty good uh, for a little prairie garden that is going out in front of um, a larger prairie area. And they were going to label some of the plants in this garden, I believe. They have a key showing which plants are which in their layout. Um, and then these little shaded areas say native milkweed and nectar plants um, are grant plants. And they did not have those fully specified but they did have a list included in their plant section of the plants that they were going to try to get for those areas. So I kind of knew what was going in there. And they had a full description of the site elsewhere that let me know what size this area really was. Uh, here's one that was pretty ambitious, um, but unfortunately it was extremely difficult to read. And hand-drawn is fine, but uh, you know, please go to a little effort so that your hard work shows its best for the committee. I have some hardworking volunteers that read these grants with me. We had 75 applications this year, and we're only able to fund about 22 grants. Um, so when we get something like this, you're really asking us to work pretty hard to say, wait, is that scratched out or is that what they meant? Oh, and oh, they say white honeysuckle. Which one did they mean? There's quite a few that that could mean. So it's, it indicates they've done some thinking, they've done some work, but they just haven't cleaned it up enough for the committee to use easily. You can also rip out little paper shapes that sort of represent the size, the finished size of the plants. There in the corner of the screen, you might be able to make out we have the finished width of some of the plants that are specified. And those are actually scaled circles um, that represent the relative sizes of those plants. And they've been laid out in a scaled representation of the garden that they're going to go in. You notice that the Maximilian sunflower, maybe the big yellow circle, because that's a big plant when it's mature, kind of overlaps the antelope horns, but that's okay because Maximilian sunflower is going to be small in the spring when the antelope horns are really blooming. And then those antelope horns really won't mind a little bit of shade later on when the Maximilian sunflowers get big. They may even already be dormant um, by the time that Maximilian sunflower really gets going. So this garden design actually tells us People know the sizes of those finished plants. They've arranged them in a way that will be reasonable for those plants to complete their life cycles. And um, they all fit in the space that they had specified. Here's one from Wood County Arboretum. And I would have loved to have seen the size somewhere on that, this neat little starfish shaped garden. They had all kinds of sort of philosophical things in the commenting section of, of their um, 
application. So we knew that they were kind of looking to keep similar colors together. They had some other things they were working with. They were refurbishing a whole big section of the Arboretum that had been neglected and needed to be redone. Uh, but we'll see what the results look like a little bit later. This was an ambitious project and I think it went pretty well. Section five, how will your garden be seen and used by the public? I'm looking for, our gates are open to the public from nine to five and there's a good deal of drive-through traffic because blah, blah, blah. Or uh, the garden is adjacent to a public sidewalk and pedestrians will be able to see our signs and our plants and read about the plants. Um, or we will lead public tours, um, you know, every so often, or just how is this going to be seen physically and used by the public and how often if possible. And the same for describe the educational aspects of your garden program or plans. You may be deciding that you're going to have speakers that come out and speak in the garden or about the garden. You may, may be um, in the time of COVID, you may be running virtual programs about your garden and where someone goes out and highlights the plants that are blooming each month out there. Um, or it may be in a schoolyard, which makes it sort of a no-brainer. It's going to be used by maybe the science class or the horticulture class or the biology class. But tell us who's going to use this garden and how if it has an educational component. That education does not have to be active for it to qualify. It can be passive education. If you put up some signage and people can tell that you've used native plants in this garden and it's going to benefit monarch butterflies, then that counts. That's a form of education. But we want to know, what are your plans? How are you going to use this? Um, and, and tell us the thrilling things that you expect to be going on out there. We want to be encouraged at this point in the application. Section six, volunteer information. Well, we lose a lot of applications from the good pile to the bad pile in this section. Uh, sometimes their answers for these questions are a bit revealing in a negative way. List organizations supplying volunteers. How many volunteers do you expect to participate in the project? This is a hard question to answer. A lot of times they don't really know, but sometimes they really, really do, and it's an easy question for them, and they can say, we have three dedicated volunteers from our garden club that have adopted this project and will be there every Wednesday. Um, and so then we really know somebody is on board with this project. Volunteers can be temporary, just to install, um, or just to plan or they can be permanent, uh, the people who are actually out there maintaining that garden from week to week, year to year. We'd like to see these gardens persist. What is your estimate of the number of man hours contributed by these volunteers? Well, this can be a hard question to answer too, but we want you to give it a stab because this is where you really think about what does it take to keep a garden running? How, what is it going to take to actually install a garden? Um, and so having to answer those questions makes the application a little harder, but I think it makes the gardens more successful in the long run that they had to answer it to get the money. Create an activity and task schedule uh, and a maintenance program. How many volunteers? What types of tasks? How often include both installation and maintenance schedules? Here we're looking for realism more than anything. We're not looking for, uh, you know, so-and-so will arrive at eight o'clock and unlock the gate. By 8.05, the uh, volunteers will arrive. It's not needing to be that detailed. But we do want to know that you've thought of all the maintenance tasks that are likely to crop up and that someone is going to be available to do those on a reasonable basis. So this is sort of your reality check section where you can tell us, yeah, we know what it's going to take to keep a garden running. Additional information. Hi, Carol. I just are want to give you a 10 minute warning and then oh, we'll do uh, 15 okay. minutes. How are yeah. your slides? Is it okay? Right. Uh, Doable? Yes, 10 minutes for more slides. Is that what we're saying? Yes. Okay, can do. 
Um, and we're really almost at the end. So additional information. Tell us about any additional information. This can be we work with special populations um, or we're at a school and we have plans to use this in our curriculum or just anything that really you think will put your application over the top in the decision uh, yes versus no piles. And finally, the grant check information. Who do we send a check to if and when your grant is approved? Um, and this needs to be completed pretty carefully. We've had some checks come back to us simply because it was not completed accurately. So double check that if you're filling out a grant. So what do we look for? We're looking for knowledge of native versus non-native plants, uh, pre-approval from any authorities needed, and the probability of long-term success, your location, your team, your succession plan. If it's at a school, who's taking over once the enthusiastic parent that has planned this garden no longer has kids at that school? Uh, plants well chosen for the site. Are their attributes understood? Have you put a six foot Maximilian sunflower six inches from your pathway? Maintenance plan and personnel, who's doing this? How are they doing it? Your water source, you'll need a water source to get your plants established most likely. Your installation plan, and just that you understand the care, the needs, and the sizes of these plants. Uh, evidence of basic gardening skills is great if you can work that into your application and that your expectations are realistic. We've actually had people say, I'm going to put this garden in, and two weeks later, we're going to be tagging monarchs in that garden. Um, and realistically, that's probably not going to happen. We look for a level of specificity, um, and that can vary year to year, application to application, depending on what that application has going for it. But please don't tell us we're going to use all native plants. Tell us which ones. And if you can use the Latin names, that's even better because a lot of native plants will share common names. The ability to sell fun can be both pro or con, um, and it kind of depends. If you have a large ambitious project and you've already lined up some funding for it, you're partially self-funded, but maybe you still need some funds from us. Um, however, if you're a large corporation and we know you've got deep pockets, you're not getting our precious pennies. We're not that big and we're not that well healed. The actual garden layout counts big and the use model counts as well. For a school garden, we really like to see that the curriculum is going to be well integrated with the garden and that um, the classes are actually going out there to do things with that garden that they need to do in their curriculum. Uh, we also like to see some sort of monitoring, either monarch tagging or monarch counting. That can be in the egg, the larva, or the adult stage, because those things really get people engaged and they ensure that that garden gets used year after year and will persist. Schools have a lot of turnover, both in teachers and administration. So unfortunately, although that's a great place to have a garden, there's a lot of turnover. And we find that those gardens get ripped out, torn up, and replaced quite often and appropriateness for your region. So what happens if you don't get uh, your grant? Well, you get a lengthy email saying, uh, here are some ways that you might have failed and that you might do better. You get an invitation to call me or email me, and sometimes you get an encouraging personal phone call to discuss ways that it could have gone better and encourage you to reapply next time around. Um, and then I do spend a lot of time on the phone and on emails exchanging ideas with people and trying to help them do better at this next time. You can think of it as a, a program that uh, is an investment in research to learn about how gardens thrive or fail and what makes a good garden plan. Okay, so does it work? Now we're going to look at some of our successes. This was at a state park out front of a meeting center. Here's an email I received, and this woman said she literally cried when she saw the first phase installation pictures. She is the administrator for two um, uh, national wildlife refuges, and uh, so other groups were doing the installation, but she was utterly thrilled with the results. Uh, this was out in Muleshoe. It's shaped like a butterfly outlined in rocks, and it may look a little messy, but they are actually using this for education, leading tours through there, identifying the plants with visitors, um, and they did have monarchs visit that garden. 
Driftwood, Texas had deer to contend with, and so they had to take some special measures to make sure their baby plants weren't all munched up, but they left room for the monarchs to come and go. Mercer Botanic Gardens used some money for a milkweed test patch, and then they were able to give better recommendations for which milkweeds monarchs actually use in Houston, Texas. A Christian church in Austin, Texas got a grant. This was a seaside park, uh, or maybe not seaside, but somewhere near the coast. And they actually had monarchs come through in their first season. Wood County Arboretum, this was a few pictures from showing some of the brush that they had to clear to put in that big starfish shaped garden with the uh, fountain in the middle that we saw in the plan. They have signage, and here's one of those arms after it was all cleaned up and planted. Stephen F. Austin Park bulldozed a site. <laughs> they even found rodents when they were clearing their site. Um, then they ordered seed, which is a little unusual, to put in um, uh, pea family plants, which will help enhance the soil fertility for their next step, which was to put in pathways and replant with a monarch garden there at their visitor center. Uh, it's not a visitor center, it's kind of a meeting area. And the Allen Her Heritage Village. Now this lady is your classic master gardener, not all that interested in native plants until recently. Um, and so this garden that they proposed already had some plants in it. They were applying for money to add native plants to their garden. And here's what she said. They have performed superbly and I'm planting another nine on campus. That was about their native milkweed. Awesome in our garden, just bought two more for another area on campus. I hate how landscapers try to share them. So this is changing her perception of how plants should look in a garden, how plants should behave in a garden, and what's possible with native plants. Here's another comment from the same lady. Rarely stops blooming, likes deadheading, plays well with others. She's talking about the native prairie verbena. Here's the part I really love. We will be combining it with four nerve daisies in the future because those are not native plants that she's combined it with this time around. No pesticides in our park from one lady. Here's another one from the Allen Heritage Village with pollinators using their garden like crazy, little skipper butterflies and some native bees as well as the monarchs. Uh, and I think, um, sorry, I don't know where that one's from. I think that's again from the Allen Heritage Park after they decided to add the wildflower section. Hunt Garden Club did a project at an elementary school and this is a garden club that's not necessarily focused on native plants. Um, I think they had some people do the report and some people do the gardening. So some of the names are not exactly correct, but the garden is pretty nice. Here's a, um, a representative prairie at the Sci-Fair um, School District. A wetland, sort of a, not a wetland, but a floodplain garden to reclaim some unused area in um, uh, Carrollton. And this one is an, actually an example of one we did not fund, but was matched up with a chapter near them to help provide some plants and some funding to do this small garden back here. They were right on that cutoff, pretty well planned, but just not quite. And uh, so we matched them up with a chapter who then helped them complete their project. Another school. And this one is at a junior college. My dear friend Amy planned the um, uh, and it was funded by Kathy before I was ever chairman of this. So uh, it's not like I was funding my friends on purpose. This is the windmill garden at Brookhaven College. And the people that she is sharing this garden with in this slide are actually from a different junior college who have come to learn how to do this on their campus. They have regular uh, walkers from the neighborhood that come by and stop and ask questions about the garden. Some of them say, I've been a master gardener for years and I've never seen this plant. Tell me about it. What is it? I love it. Um, so they get all kinds of really good quality comments. These are all at that windmill garden from the neighborhood and from the school uh, that's using it. One of my favorites is Tennyson Pollinator Parkway. Well planned, well designed in a public area between two pieces of roadway, uh, but the neighborhood uses this place to walk and sit. 
And it's a very attractive garden to my eye with a lot of diversity and a lot of things using the garden in addition to monarchs. They also have a newsletter where they publicize the, uh, a plant and feature a plant and they give away plants from babies from this garden. Things that have over reproduced, they pot up and give away to the neighborhood. Um, and they also start plants from seeds from this garden. So this, this project is doing not just duty for monarchs and native plants, it's really introducing the neighborhood to the use of native plants in their own landscapes. And I love some of the combinations that they put together at Tennyson. These are all from there. Karen Albrecht um, has, you know, happily shared pictures of that nice garden. So our future goals. Well, I'd love to host a full day pollinator garden workshop, either in, um, in conjunction with the NLCP program that uh, Native Plant Society sponsors or in a different format. I'd love to have some online educational tools for the garden design process, starting from choosing your site and evaluating your soil and your shade, um, right on up through choosing and citing the plants on that design. I'd like to have online plant lists available by region. If you're in Muleshoe and you're in Houston, you are not gonna be planting the same plants and we need to know what works in the different areas. I'd like to have online sample garden plans from each chapter. That would be great. Just give us a round garden, an oval garden, whatever you would like with appropriate plants spaced appropriately. And I'd also like to have some uh, committee and grantee mentor relationships going. And so you could volunteer to be a liaison with some uh, uh, grants uh, that either were funded or were not funded that need the advice and the help of a Native Plant Society member. And think about how you can help with these, right? You could become one of those chapter liaisons you could volunteer to visit completed gardens just so we can see what's actually gone on there. It's really hard to visit all over the state. Um, when we fund these gardens, we'd like some real eyes to go see what, what happened there. Generate lists of verified nectar plants for your immediate area that you've actually seen monarchs using. Create those garden plans, uh, volunteer to mentor a local applicant, and talk to your chapter about donating. Don't wait for someone else to take conservation steps. It's up to you, all of us, to do this in our own landscapes and any piece of ground that we have influence over. So I think that is it for today. And if you have other questions, uh, you can always email me at bbmt at nipsot.org and that will get forwarded to me and I will try to answer those as quickly as I can. So Gary, I'm gonna hand this back to you to read some questions. I hope I didn't run over too much. No, not too bad. Um, thank you so much, Carol. Uh, we have just a few questions and I'll go in the order that I received them. Okay. Um, I've got one from Aubrey Sanders here who is asking, um, early on in your presentation, there was a photo of some folks at a detention center, a ju I guess juvenile detention center, and was mm -hmm. asking if you remember the name of that detention center. I do not, and um, I've also been told by somebody who used to work at one that if I did, I shouldn't share that. <laughs> so um, that's, that's not something they don't like to be real public about where those are. No worries. Uh, she did say it's a very uh, cool in terms of initiatives. So Thanks. I suppose, Aubrey, if you're interested, might want to reach out to some local detention centers and see if there's something you can do to set that up with them and have a similar project. Uh, okay, uh, next question is from Jennifer Howell, and I'm, and, uh, I'm going to kind of summarize this. Uh, she's interested in perhaps doing a butterfly garden at a, a cemetery here in Williamson County. Mm -hmm. um, the, she's approached the cemetery board and they like the idea, but they're worried about uh, the fact that there's no running water at the cemetery. Do you know yeah. how some of the gardens handle that? Ah, oh, yeah, that's that's a little tough. So to be able to win a grant, you're going to have to prove to me that you can um, 
you can successfully establish the plants. And that's where you're going to need the water during the establishment phase. You might be able to plant something that uses pretty tough plants that don't need a lot of water once they're established. I mean, monarchs use wild plants that don't need watering all the time. Um, but that's going to have to show in your design and planning and maybe tell me that you've got a, a wagon with a water reservoir that you're going to tow out there with a little trailer to water them during the establishment phase, something like that. Uh, cemeteries, by the way, we've had cemetery applicants. They are not automatically rejected. They can be a great place to put a garden. Um, I did reject one this year simply because I did not feel like the site was really going to have a lot of uh, public traffic through there. So you might want to think about whether or not that site would actually get people visiting it. Okay, that's a very good point. All right. Uh, next, I have just a couple of comments from, from Arlene uh, Boyer um, here in Williamson County. Uh, she just mentions that over the years, uh, Book has had some great projects, and we had some of the earliest grants for gardens from NIPSAT, and we still have some some of these sites are still around. And, Yay, and great. <laughs> it's really good to hear that they're still active. Our big fear, and it's a reasonable and justified fear, is that the gardens will not persist. And um, so the redesign of the application is to try to force people to think through everything they need so they will persist. So I know that's a lot of information to digest, but uh, hopefully, if you're a Native Plant Society member, you now know what this committee is about and does and hopes to do in the future. Um, and if you're not, then maybe you would consider putting in a grant application sometime to, to see if you can put in a garden somewhere. All right. Um, Thank that you is very all much, that. Carol. We appreciate it. You're so welcome. All right. Um, that is all the time that we have. So thanks, everybody, for attending. Um, Again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we'll have this recorded and we'll post it to YouTube. And I believe, Randy, I'm behind on giving you the one that we did last go around. So we'll we'll do a two okay. for one this time. Yeah. All right. Great. One last thing: don't hesitate to reach out to me in the planning phases if you need. Um, you know, if you don't even have any idea where to start, we'll have some conversations. Okay. Great. All right. Thanks so much, and thanks, Randy and Carol. You're welcome. Okay, Bye -bye. good night, everyone. Good night.